welcome to this lecture. This is the second lecture of week 1. In first lecture, we have discussed certain introductory materials and recalled some other preliminary results. From this lecture onwards, we are going to enter the main course contents. We will move on to the slides. So, in this lecture, we are going to talk about the LP spaces. Let us first set up some very basic notations. Omega f mu and omega f p shall denote a measure space and a probability space respectively. Here, remember a probability measure is a measure with full mass being 1. And whenever we are going to talk about any measurable functions, we are going to denote them by small letters like f and g. And whenever we are talking about random variables, we are going to write them by capital letters like capital X, capital Y like this. Whenever we are going to talk about these measurable functions, we will assume that these are defined on this measure space omega f mu and similarly for random variables, we are going to require this probability space omega f p. Unless stated otherwise, all of these functions that we are dealing with will be assumed to be real valued. So, let us start with the main results. The first thing that we need to recall is this very important result from measure theoretic integration which is called the dominated convergence theorem. Here let us first recall one version of dominated convergence theorem. Suppose you get this function f and another sequence of functions f1, f2 and so on. These are all assumed to be Borel measurable functions on this measure space omega f mu and such that the functions point wise converge to f almost everywhere. Just to recall this concept of almost everywhere convergence, it simply means that on the complement of a null set, you get the convergence and on the null set for some points you might have convergence, might not have convergence, but that will not really matter in our final analysis because we are going to be interested in integrations and in integrations measure, uh, measure sets of measure 0 are not really playing a role. Now, in this dominated convergence theorem, as soon as you have this pointwise convergence, if there exists an integrable function g with the property that all the functions f n are dominated by g in this inequality, then the limit function f is also integrable. So, that is the first implication of the dominated convergence theorem. And moreover, the important thing says that integration of f is equal to limit of the integrated values of f n. So, here you see this is essentially a exchange of limit and integration f being the limit of functions on the left hand side the limit process is inside the integration on the right hand side the limit process is outside the integration. And finally, you can also say something more that modulus of f n minus f if you integrate it and take limits then that will go to 0. So, this is the full statement of the dominated convergence theorem. Now, just to increase our familiarity with this type of results, let us just look at the version in terms of random variables. So, this is the restatement in terms of the random variables. So, again we will deal with a sequence of random variables x1, x2, xn and so on and a limit random variable which is generated by capital X. Suppose these xn's converge point wise to the limit random variable capital X almost surely. That again means that outside a set of probability 0, you must have the convergence and that sets of probability 0 that will be in your hand. But in all practical purposes like integration and all, this set of measure 0 will not play any important role. Now, if there exists a random variable y such that all these random variables are dominated in this way and moreover expected value of mod y is finite, then x must be integrable. So, x being the limit random variable. So, that is the first statement. Then 
The next statement is this exchange of limit and integration procedure, which is saying that x total value of capital X is the limit of x total value of x n. And finally, the other result that we also had in the general case of measurable functions, now it can be restated in terms of expectation like this that mod absolute uh, first moment of x n minus x limit of that must be 0. So, as soon as we have recalled this dominated convergence theorem, this can be generalized very easily to other very interesting conditions. First one involves moments of random variables. So, in the dominated convergence theorem that we have stated involve the first absolute moments, but as we have already recalled in the first lecture, we can talk about general moments and here what we are going to do is to restate these results or reformulate these results involving pth moments. So, let us first state in terms of the measurable functions. So, again take a sequence of measurable functions f 1, f 2 and so on defined on that measurable space omega f together with the measure mu and let small f denote the pointwise limit of this sequence of functions and the pointwise limit should hold mu almost everywhere. If there exists a Borel measurable function g such that the all these functions are dominated like this, then what you can do is that you can ask for this integrability condition now in terms of the pth power of the function g. So, note that here as soon as we have asked about this uh, moment bounds which we have also appeared in the earlier versions of the DCT which we recalled. Strictly speaking, we do not really need to write down the modulus here, modulus of g here, but uh, we write it just for the completeness sake. Now, what we are saying is look at the pth power of modulus of g and integrate it. What we want is this integrability condition that this integral must be finite. If this holds, then first comment is that all these functions f n that we have considered, each of these the pth power of modulus of fn must have finite integrals. Then the limit function also has a finite integral raised to the pth power. Moreover, the exchange of limit and integration that we have been talking about is still valid. So, this equality holds. And finally, modulus of fn minus f raised to the power p, if you integrate it as n goes to infinity, this goes to 0. So, this is involving the pth power and this can be generalized very easily from the previous version. Let us now state the same result, but in terms of random variables. Let us again take a sequence of random variables x1, x2, xn and so on with almost sure limit being held. Now, so the pointwise convergence is holding on a set of probability 1. If there exists an integrable random variable, with this property integrability condition being this that expected mod y to the power p is finite. And if all the random variables are dominated by y in this way, then the similar conclusions we can draw. The first thing being that all the pth absolute moments of the random variables x n are finite. Then the limit random variable capital X also has finite pth absolute moment then the limit of uh, the exchange of limit and expectation holds so that is this result. And finally, that the random variable x n minus x has finite pth absolute moment, but as n goes to infinity, this goes to 0. So, we have seen these generalizations, straightforward generalizations of the dominated convergence theorem, but in terms of the pth absolute moments of random variables. So, the way to obtain this is very simple. You just replace the first absolute moment in all our discussions as you try to prove it by pth absolute moments. If you are not clear about the argument here, I request you to go back to the basic materials books that has been supplied and check the proofs there. As we have seen in the dominated convergence theorem that we have stated two versions, one for the measurable functions and one for the random variables. We continue with that practice so that we get more familiarity in stating these same concepts in two different settings, one for the 
measurable functions and one for the random variables. This will be useful because we are using this functional analytic techniques coming into measure theory and we are using them in the language of probability theory. So, we have to be clear about both the settings coming from the functional analysis and measure theory and also from the probability theory side. So, we will continue to state these versions both for measurable functions and for random variables separately. Now, we come to the main content and start with a definition. We define something called LP spaces where P is chosen between 1 to infinity, 1 included, infinity excluded. First thing is that this LP spaces will be defined on the measure space that we have talked about and these LP spaces are nothing but the collection of measurable functions such that the pth power of modulus of f should have finite integral. We denote this class of functions by this notation Lp omega f mu, but in short we will write Lp of mu. Essentially the underlying space will be understood from the context and the measure is what is playing the important role. So, this is a class of functions which we shall discuss in more detail as we go along. It is time to introduce a very important notation which is that for all the for the functions in this class that we have just discussed, we introduce this notation that norm of f p norm is defined to be the pth root of the integration that we have just taken to be finite. So, we read it as p norm of f and the description again is the pth root of the pth power of absolute of f integration of that. Now, as we have already stated, we are going to discuss about a similar version for random variables, but here underlying we have this probability measure p. So, again we are going to look for a class of random variables or defined on this probability space and we are going to look at those random variables which has pth absolute moment which is finite. So, on this class of random variables, we are going to introduce the similar notation which is the pth root of pth absolute moment of capital X and that we shall call as the p norm of capital X. Now, in this definition, several comments are out of importance. The first thing that we should be aware of is that in this definition, we could have easily taken p to be positive because we can talk about pth moment for p greater than 0. But as you have seen, we have taken p to be between 1 and infinity, 1 included, infinity excluded. The reason for choosing this very restrictive range will be clear as we go along and discuss in further subsequent lectures. What it is requiring is that in this restrictive range of p, we get very nice properties of this norm p and this will be discussed in detail in later lectures. Now, as for examples, let us first recall the Lebesgue measure lambda on the real. This measure is uniquely determined by the property that you look at left open right close intervals a to b and look at the size of that if lambda assigns the length of the interval to be b minus a. And this property uniquely characterizes the Lebesgue measure. Now, for the convenience of notation for measurable functions on the real line, real value and measurable functions on the real line, we are going to write integration f x dx to denote this measure theoretic integration with respect to the Lebesgue measure. This is a more of a shorthand notation and the reason for using this notation is that for nice functions f, for example, for continuous functions, the demand integration matches with that of the Lebesgue integration. Therefore, we will continue to use this simplified notation for the Lebesgue integrations. We shall also use the notation Lp of r to denote Lp of this Lebesgue measure space because here we understand that on the real line there is this very nice natural choice of measure which is the Lebesgue measure. Now, let us come to some examples 
which are part of some exercises which I hope you will try out. Start with this function f defined on the real line defined by that you send any real number x to this value 1 by 1 plus x square that is how the function gets defined. Check that this function is in L1 of R that is for p equal to 1. For random variables a similar exercise is like this start with the constant random variable or the degenerate random variable at 1 which is defined on this probability space omega fp. So, therefore, you are essentially getting a function on this probability space which is taking the constant value 1. You can try to show that this random variable x is actually is in Lp for all the values of p that we have considered. So, this gives us some examples to all to work with. Now, using this p norms and Lp spaces that we have just discussed, we can now restate the dominated convergence theorem results that we have just discussed. So, we are now restating proposition 1 in proposition 2. So, we continue with this very specific range of p which is between 1 and infinity, 1 included, infinity excluded. Take this sequence of functions f1, f2, fn and take the limit function f which is a pointwise limit in the almost everywhere sense. If there exists a function g which is in Lp means that it is a measurable function and the modulus of g raised to the power p is integrable. Then for such functions if you have this nice bounds available to you then the first comment is that all these functions that we are considering f, f1, f2 and so on are in Lp. Then there is this exchange of limit and the norm which is the integration procedure that is given by this and finally the limit of norm of f minus fn the p norm that goes to 0. The similar result can now be stated for random variables like this. Let us say x1, x2, xn is a sequence of random variables and x being the almost sure limit of that. If there exists a random variable y which is in Lp that means that its pth absolute moment is finite. If it happens that all these random variables xn's are dominated by y in this way then the random variables x, x1, x2 and so on are in Lp. That means all of these has finite pth, pth absolute moments being finite and moreover there is this exchange of integration and the limit which is in terms of the norm and the limit here and finally there is this limit procedure which is x minus xn the p norm of that must go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Now, these norms that we have just discussed has very nice properties and we are going to explore them in our discussions. The first very important result is called scalar multiplication. So, we are choosing a number alpha from the real line which will act as the scalar. Then taking any LP function f we can try to multiply it by the scalar this is the scalar multiplication and the claim is that this alpha times f this is a new function which is must be again in Lp. Moreover the corresponding norm can be simplified and written as mod alpha times norm of f. A similar version for the random variables goes like this you take a random variable x whose pth absolute moment is finite then multiplying by the scalar alpha you again get a Lp function Lp random variable with the norm of alpha x being mod alpha times norm x. So, here the relations involving the norm are straightforward these just in, in involve certain manipulations involving this integrations as you can see here. But the important verification that is involved is the verification of the measurability conditions and another comment is that in this statement first we have stated it for the measurable functions and then for the random variables. But just recall that random variable is nothing but a measurable function but defined on a probability space. So, this is essentially a special case. So, part 2 turns out to be a special case of part 1. 
So it's enough to prove part one only for the measurable functions case. Now again, as we have already discussed, the relation involving the norm is straightforward. So we only need to ensure that alpha times f is in LP. To show this, we need to show two things. First, the function alpha times x f is measurable and modulus of alpha f raised to the power p must be integrable with the measure mu. The measurability of this uh, function alpha times f follows from basic algebraic properties of measurable functions that you take a function f multiply by a scalar alpha you get a measurable function. The other thing is the finiteness of this integration and that follows very easily using properties of integration that you can bring out these scalars from your calculations and since f is already in LP this integration is finite. So overall expression turns out to be finite and that completes the proof. We now come to the very next important result which talks about almost everywhere equality of functions and its connection with the norm that we have just talked about. Observe that if you take two functions which are equal mu almost everywhere then it is equivalent to the fact that the function modulus of f minus g is 0 mu almost everywhere this is equivalent. But this is also equivalent to the fact that this function has a 0 integral. So this is a non-negative function with integral 0 and therefore it must also be 0 almost everywhere. So you get both direction on this equivalence. Once you have that you can now rewrite in terms of the notation that we have introduced in terms of the p norm. So as soon as this integral is 0 therefore you can immediately say that f minus g the p norm of that must be 0. So what we have ended up observing is that if you have two functions equal almost everywhere then f minus g that norm p norm of that is 0. We can state a similar version for random variables like this. Again consider two random variables x and y which are equal almost everywhere then modulus of x minus y is 0 almost surely. This is equivalent to the fact that expected value of mod of x to the x minus y raised to the power p that means the pth absolute moment of x minus y is 0. But restating in terms of the p norm that we have just discussed it turns out that this is equal to 0. So therefore the equivalence that we have talked about in the setting of measurable functions also holds in the case of random variables that if you have two random variables which are equal almost everywhere then x minus y in p norm has to be 0. We have repeated this comment earlier but it stressed need, to, need to be stressed once more that while dealing with integration of measurable functions or expectations of random variables if you have functions or random variables which differ on a null set that means it is a set of measure 0 then uh, these functions may be considered to be the same because their integrals turn out to be the same and to be more precise we make this more mathematically precise statement that you can talk about a equivalence relation on this set of functions LP of mu. Let us discuss this slowly. So we take two functions and say that f is related to g if and only if f minus g the p norm of that is 0. So in this relation that we have introduced observe that as per our earlier discussion f will be related to g if and only if they are equal almost everywhere. Now it is a straightforward argument that this tilde turns out to be an equivalence relation on the set of functions LP. And as soon as you can show that this is a equivalence relation the main class gets partitioned into equivalence classes which are denoted in standard notations like this. And once you get this equivalence classes then you essentially get representative functions from each class. In each class you get functions which are equal almost surely. In what follows 
we were we are going to work with this equivalence classes only of measurable functions or random variables but to avoid this notational complexity we shall only write lp of mu instead of writing this whole thing we understand that underlying there is this equivalence relation which are about which is about this equivalence between functions or random variables but after this equivalence is established we get this equivalence classes and we work with this equivalence classes but just to simplify our notations we are going to use this old notation and we are not going to distinguish between the equivalence class and any representative function of this class okay so once you have this representative function then you can get to the equivalence class and given the equivalence class you can get a representative function so while working we do not explicitly write it as in terms of equivalence classes but rather functions and we understand that the equivalence relation that we are discussing is about equal almost sure relation in the next lecture we are going to explore more properties of this norm function that we have introduced and this will be in terms of the inequalities that we have in fact recalled in lecture 1 we are going to restate these inequalities in terms of this norm function and these are going to lead us to some nice continuity properties and for random variables these inequalities are actually involving inequalities on moments we shall explore these topics in further detail in the next lecture thank you